Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Remnant Call. I am your host, Brother Frank, and glad to be here with you. Folks, I just want to say a few things just to understand who Brother Frank is. I am a man who is fiercely independent, and I believe that following the Word of God is the way we should do. But I also believe that we have freedom of thought and freedom to express our views on how we interpret the scripture. Why I'm saying this is because I don't necessarily agree with everything all of my guests come on and share. Unless you hear me say it myself, don't pin that to my beliefs. I also don't believe in stifling and muzzling every person in order to get out their thoughts and beliefs on something, even when I may disagree. That happened back in the dark ages when the Catholic Church tried to force people to not read the Bible, only to listen and regurgitate what the priests told them. Folks, thank goodness for those people who stood against that and read the word for themselves and stood up for their beliefs, even though it was contrary. Folks, we need to give other people the room to also share, even when you may not agree with every topic. I say this, folks, to just understand that I will have people on from time to time that don't necessarily say stuff that you might agree with. Maybe I don't agree with, but that doesn't mean they're not good people and God doesn't love them and they don't have something good to share. Our job as Bereans is to read the word, to study it, to see if what people say is true. I've realized a lot of things. I can learn something from almost anybody. I do not believe in Mormonism. I think it's a dangerous religion. But you know what? A lot of Mormons know how to spend good quality time with their family. I think that's important. I don't believe in Jehovah's Witnesses religion at all. But I do know that they had a lot of truth about some of the pagan holidays long before the rest of the church caught up. So I can take those little tidbits, test them against the word, and then put them into my own life and apply them to the way that I live. Folks, that is our job as Bereans to do that. Well, tonight I've got an exciting show on because this show is going to be very poignant and it's going to be very personal. Let's pray. Father, in the name above every name, Yeshua, we believe that by the power of the sacrifice, that the price was paid, that we, Lord, as that wild olive tree would have the right to be grafted in, Lord, to be a part of the root. And so, Lord, I pray tonight that you would speak in a powerful way that all Israel shall be saved as your word says, Lord, that it won't be much longer as we're going through these trying times, remembering that Jesus is coming soon. Father, I ask that you'd guide my lips, my thoughts, my words. In Jesus' name, amen. Jim Elliott was a martyred missionary in 1956 by the primitive Aka Indians in the jungles of Ecuador. Jim had had such a passion to reach the lost only to end up being killed by the savages. Now, interesting enough, my father actually has met the man who killed this wonderful missionary. People were looking at the situation, were wondering naturally, where is God in all of this? This was not enough to stop, though, the passion that not only Jim had, but his wife shared also as she moved into the jungle with the very Indians that killed her husband. By God's grace and through the door opened at her husband's death, God moved powerfully to save the lives of the Aka as they gave their hearts to Jesus. One man's death ended up blessing those who killed him as they received the good news of Jesus. Before Jim's death, he journaled many of his thoughts and prayers. One such entry uh, he had written said this, Father, make of me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to decision. Let me not be a milepost on a single road. Make me a fork that men must turn one way or another on facing Christ in me. His impact continues on even though he died over 50 years ago at the age of only 29. You see, Jim was not an ordinary believer and neither was his wife. He didn't want to simply just share the good news. He wanted to make a difference in people's life, and the difference was simple. Jim wanted to bring people to a point of decision. You see, when we meet people, we learn to know them, and we gain their trust. 
We meet their needs. We begin to share the gospel with them. But there comes a point in the process where we need to cross that bridge and call people to a decision to follow Jesus. It's like hanging out with someone hooked on crack and just constantly sitting around and watching them smoke it. There comes a point in time when you have to rise up and say, man, that stuff is killing you. I love you too much to let you continually ruin your life. I thank God for people who had the courage to stand up against me when I was strung out on drugs. I had plenty of friends who sat around happy to watch me kill myself because all they cared about is if I had some dope that they could get high on. I called them friends, but they were not my friends in reality. Those who loved me enough to stand against my destructive behavior, those were the ones who truly cared for me. I didn't always like them at the time. I got upset by the way that they would always be wanting me to change, but in the end, it was them who reminded me constantly that there was a better way and his name was Jesus. You see, it's not just them though. This world is an absolute mess and people are trying to find hope and love and the exact opposite is happening with loneliness, stress, depression, dysfunctional homes, marriages, jobs, family, and more, constantly hoping for the weekend and maybe it will get better only to reface it all again on Monday. Why would we want to share the hope in Jesus in such a messed up world as we live in today where our children are growing up not even understanding what a proper marriage looks like? And here we are believers tasting the good things of Christ and yet we so often remain silent. My message tonight is very simple. The abyss of no decision. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 33. Starting in verse 31, let's listen to what the word of God says. And they came unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this come to pass, and lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. You see, here Ezekiel was coming out and trying to speak to God's children that were in rebellion. And he said that, that Ezekiel, they love to come hear you. They love to listen to your voice. It's like a beautiful song. But the words that you ask them to do, they will not do them. Let me try to put this into perspective. See, in Ezekiel's day, they loved to hear him preach. And in many of our days, we like to hear people preach or say a program. We like to go to church or go visit in a group with somebody and they like to maybe even say hallelujah or praise God during a sermon or a worship service. You know, and you'll probably even hear a few amens so everybody knows around them how spiritual they actually are. They love to listen to the preacher's voice. They love to listen to a voice on a podcast, but to actually follow the words that are spoken that come from the Lord out of his holy word, they want to do them not. They don't want to. God is frustrated in Ezekiel's day, and he's frustrated in our day. He's trying to warn his people. He wants to wake them up, but all they want to do is play church in whatever form that comes. You see, we'd love to talk about what's going on in the world and the impact in the last days and all this stuff, which is absolute crisis. But to actually follow through and to make a change and do something is a very rare thing this day and age. You see, in the Jewish religion, and my wife can attest to this, we, she helped raise a Jewish family, their children. Even the most secular, and Brother Zev has even spoke about this, will celebrate the holy days. They may live like the world, but because they are Jewish, there's a belief among many that their religion is good enough to save them. And we know for a fact that the Bible says there's only one way to the Father, and it is through the Son. 
But upon reflecting upon my Jewish friends and family and people like th- that, that I know, that those that are secular and, and even those that are not, but those that don't know Jesus but think that their religion may save them, I realize that in the churches today, in modern-day Christianity, we have the exact same things going on. Many people put their faith in what they were taught as children being growing up or what their church has taught them or myself even being a Sabbath keeper. I know people that are fellow Sabbath keepers that think keeping Sabbath is what saves them. And I I just don't understand that kind of craziness. And, And when the truth is, so many people have no idea who it is that they are actually serving. It's only their religion that they believe is saving them. Now, they won't tell you that, but that is the truth because to find out who they actually serve, many times their life does not reflect it at all. And the Bible is very clear when it says that by their fruits, ye shall know them. Folks, I hear people out on the internet and all the times, so well, the Lord said this and the Lord said that, and they always have a constant um, revelation from God, always in the moment that they need it to fit whatever it is. Folks, this many times is nothing but absolute mind-driven babble that either comes from a foul spirit or their own very imagination. But their actual lives, the fruit of what they do, doesn't resemble anything of God. It doesn't mean that a person's going to be perfect. I'm not talking about that. But there are fruits of the Spirit that describe a believer's life. And when you don't see that present, yet you see all the so-called gifts that they supposedly possess. You know, the, we talked about this last week. You can cast out a devil in the name of Jesus and still be lost. That is absolute truth. They said in that, Lord, did we not cast out devils in, in thy name? They said that, and yet they weren't even following the Lord. It's It's because the power of the Lord's name is mighty. And yet so often we fail or don't desire to follow, but we love to give the lip service or wear your T-shirts with your sayings on them or whatever the cross around your neck, whatever it might be to show everybody that you're holy. And the Lord is tired of the outward lip service. He wants to see conversion from the heart. You know, I've often seen it being relayed in a very strict upbringing in religion. Now, I left when I was very young because my parents went through a divorce, but grandparents and family, I went to a church that was very strict in their living. And if you were to smoke or drink or fight anything, that was all the devil. And I remember how hard it was for a person to try to actually get in to the faith because they had to be so perfect before they could actually join the church. And, And I remember it was so hard that you could almost not live up because sometimes, and unfortunately, Many don't believe this or don't mean to do this on purpose, but they make the religion and the views of that religion greater than the one that they serve. And here's a brother or a sister that are struggling. They aren't perfect. They're smoking, drinking, or whatever, but they need Jesus. And they're, and folks, I'm telling you right now, our job is not to clean the fish. Our job is to catch the fish. It's the Lord's job to clean them. And God will do it by the transformation of his spirit, but he's looking for commitment. You see, growing up, I only knew the rituals of the church. I didn't understand who it was that I worshiped. But I thank God that he never gave up on me, even when I was completely off track. And folks, he doesn't give up on you either, even when you're completely off off track. Turn with me to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, leading up to this, Paul had been captured. He was even prophesied not to go to Jerusalem, but he went. He knew his destruction things were coming. It was not a good thing for him. He had been brought before Festus, and now King Agrippa had come onto the scene. He was willing to hear Paul's story. And so picking up in Acts chapter 26 and verse 1, it says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech 
thee to hear me patiently. So here the apostle was before King Agrippa, and he was excited to actually share the good news of the things he had been accused of that were false, to actually share the truth because he knew that King Agrippa was no dummy. He actually understood his religion. He understood things about God, and so he's excited to share with him. In verse 12, Paul picks up, whereupon, and he was telling the story, excuse me, of where he was heading to. He says, whereupon, as I went to Damascus with the authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw in the way of light from heaven. You remember this? Paul is on the Damascus road. He had the letters. He was going to destroy the believers. He was zealous to kill that which is holy, folks. And don't think that we have not ever been in the same boat before. I see it so often when a new, hot, young believer comes in how they get the Holy Ghost, uh, you know, fire extinguisher out supposedly and squirt them down with so there's no flame left in them. And here Paul is speaking of his zealousy. Unfortunately, it was going for the wrong way. And he says, at midday, O king, I saw a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and then which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. So here the, the Lord gets a hold of Paul, shines a light on him. It's radical. And when he speaks out to him and Paul's like, well, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus. And the Lord's saying, Paul, Paul, why are you resisting? Why are you kicking against the pricks? Why are you fighting my spirit that is trying to get you to come around to following me the right way? You see, Paul, this whole time, and I believe it started back at the stoning of Stephen. That's my personal belief. When Paul was having to hold the jackets of those or the garments of had to, that were stoning him, that Paul saw his face like an angel. I believe it began to stir him and shake him up, but he was resisting. And the Lord's like, why are you resisting me? And continuing down in verse 24, and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. So as King Festus was sitting there listening, as Paul was explaining to Agrippa, he's like, Paul, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind, man. You're mad. How often do people call us mad because we're simply believers? You see, following Jesus does not mean you're always going to get the warmest reception or be called the nicest of things. Sometimes they will call you crazy. Sometimes they will call you mad. But don't be upset. They called the very apostle Paul mad right here. And yet he was speaking by the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet they called him crazy. Continuing on. Verse 25, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness for the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely for I am not, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him for this thing was not done in a corner. So here Paul is saying to Festus, look, and I'm not mad. I'm not crazy. And he turns to King Agrippa and he says, listen, King, look, I know even right now at this very moment as I'm speaking right here, that the things that I'm sharing with you, that you are not being hidden from it. God has opened his mind up to understand the truth that Paul is speaking. This is a heavenly invitation to King Agrippa at this moment. God is opening up his mind to understand it. Nothing, he says, being hid from you. Oh, King right now. And so in that moment, King Agrippa has been offered from heaven, but seeing, unfortunately, the, the pressure of the Jews that are around in Festus and all those calling Paul mad, King Agrippa looks over. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. So Paul's saying, King, do you believe? I'm sensing right now in your heart, you're stirring inside. King, the presence of God is at work right now. I know that there's pressure around, but King, right now is your opportunity right in front of everybody. But unfortunately, the pressure got to the King. This was King Agrippa's one chance to have gone down as possibly one of the greatest heroes in Bible history accepting the preaching of Apostle Paul in front of Festus and all those. But instead, look what he says in verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. 
Almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. You see, in front of all that pressure, even though this was a divine invitation from heaven delivered by the Apostle Paul, infused by the Spirit of the living God with every chance to accept Jesus, the King walked away. The gift of heaven, eternal life with Christ was offered, and yet he chose the gift of the world, which is death. You see, folks, 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, stepping down from royalty, stepping down from the throne. Jesus came to save the lost, healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the blind to see, the lame to walk, and the deaf to hear. And at the end of all the amazing, loving things that Jesus did, they hung him on a cross. And many of us are looking at, at, at this and we say, how could someone do something like that to Jesus? And yet so often, folks, we do the same thing when we don't commit and go all the way. You see, the title of my message, The Abyss of No Decision, is the madness that comes upon a believer when they like to talk and say, but are not willing to say, God, you're worth everything. I want to go all the way with you. I want to make Jesus my all in all. I want, Father, I want to give everything in my life into your hands. I want to commit everything to you, Lord. But so often, it ends up in lip service without commitment. You see, the truth is we act just like the stubborn children of Israel. We come to worship. We claim the name of Jesus around our friends or at church if you attend. We, we, we like to talk about spending time, but we don't really do it. We are just like the almost persuaded Christians that King Agrippa joined the club in. We go through the motions, but so rarely do we actually follow through. Folks, how many times have you said, I'm going to start this, I'm going to do this, yet never actually do it? The abyss of no decision is swallowing up believers in this hour. You know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's not the world, folks, who so often needs the Lord. It's the church that needs Jesus the most. There are so many people that are so lost in this hour, and yet God is giving a heavenly invitation. You see, I know there are a lot of people struggling. You're trying to find something, but there's something in your life that holds you back from that total commitment. And often I hear it in emails, well, I've been praying, but I haven't heard, or I want God to do, and he hasn't done it. I don't understand why. And folks, I'm here to tell you that if you base your relationship with God based on you getting something, then your relationship is based on the wrong foundation. We don't base our relationship on God and whether he answers a prayer the way we want him to answer. We base that relationship on the word of God, which said that he is faithful and just and that he will do what he said he does, but he will do it in his time. We don't follow because of what we get. We follow because of what he's done. In this hour, there are too many people struggling they're hurting. They are worried about the coronavirus. They're worried about the last days. They're worried about everything that's going on. And all they're doing is worrying. And folks, I'm here to tell you that worry won't get you anywhere. It's surrender to the Lord that will get you somewhere. You see, absolute surrender is the opposite of the abyss of no decision. Because in absolute surrender, you're saying, Lord, I can't do it, but I'm giving it to you because I know that you can do that which I cannot do. And if, Lord, you don't answer my prayer the way I want you to answer it, I'm still going to follow you no matter what. I'm still going to do what you want me to do, even if I'm not getting my way, Lord. Even if the bills haven't been paid, Lord, I'm still going to follow you no matter what. Folks, it's not that we don't believe. Folks, I believe in, in, in standing on the promises of God, but you have to be willing to take him as he allows it to happen. What I'm trying to say is that God answers when he is ready in the way that he wants to answer. And we do not tell God what he's going to do. 
We instead, we request, we ask, we petition, we plead, but we ultimately accept no matter what. And when you can base your relationship on what he's done versus what you can get, you will have moved from living a humanistic lifestyle to a God-centered relationship. The abyss of no decision is swallowing up too many believers. I know because I've read some of the emails. I've heard their comments. I've seen what they've said. Folks, the things that I hear said from so-called believers are absolutely atrocious. The names that I get called or the things that I'm said or God's going to punish me and all these things like that. Instead of somebody ever saying, brother, I don't agree with you, but I love you. I'm praying for you. Listen, here's my thought on this. No, you're going to hell and the devil or whatever. You know, they want to tell me you're going to be punished. for. I mean, and they're calling themselves believers, but the compassion of the Lord exists nowhere in their lives and therefore their words and their actions speak volumes of who they are you see it's in crisis that you will find out who it is that you serve it's in crisis that you will find out who it is you truly follow you see I've learned one thing through the years that no matter how bad it is no matter what situation I am in that I can think back of all the times God has come through. A few weeks ago, I was speaking in a very large congregation that had asked me to come up and speak at their church. It was intimidating. I'm not going to lie. I was very scared. The pastor at this church was a very large church. I'm not used to preaching in that large of a venue. Uh, they, it was very intimidating. He was a very powerful speaker. And, and, and I was scared to death. And I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to act like I had it all together because I certainly didn't. And I was in the side room praying and I was pleading and I was reminding God, Lord, how many times you've come through for me when I've needed you to come through. And Lord, right now I'm desperate but I need you to come through folks. And I was out of my element at this moment. I was a complete train wreck. I had already defeated myself in my own mind. This was going to be the worst message ever. And I was pleading with God. And, and as I walked out that moment, I believe God finally looked at me and said, he's like, all right, now he's out of the way. Maybe I can finally do something. And that day, what the Lord did was something I could have never imagined. He moved so powerfully in that church. And when the altar call came and the pastor was moved and he responded to the altar, the call and he, and the pastor, even in after that got transparent in this message and said, listen, folks, when I first came up here for this call, he said, I turned around and I didn't see people coming right away. The pastor said, listen, I turned around and I acted like I was just doing my pastoral duties when the truth was I was the one responding to the call. And when the church saw their own pastor get up there and humble themselves, they knew that it was okay because this call was a difficult call because it was a call to come forward no matter what situation. And sometimes when that call comes, people don't want to see you coming forward or they're embarrassed to see them coming forward that somebody might think, well, what, what's their problem? Because I spoke a lot about addiction and things that I had suffered with and struggled through the years with and God had delivered me. And the people began to came, come and God began, to move and he began to change hearts and shake that church up and I was in the back room before complete disaster and mess pleading and begging God to do something I had no confidence in myself and the Lord came through anyways not because it was for me but because he wanted to reach a people that day And right now, God is doing the same thing with the remnant call. He's trying to reach a people that are willing to take this call seriously and make a difference in somebody's life for Jesus and the life of their families and the life of their children by following the Lord and going all the way. Don't be like King Agrippa. You see, folks, 20 years ago, 
in 1999 when I came, left the house strung out on drugs, living in adultery, everything I was going on, and the Lord met me and radically saved my life outside of church. I didn't even know how to be saved. Driving down the road one day, I met the Lord, and he delivered me from these drugs and set me free. I knew that day that I'm all in, and I'm going to follow him. And no matter what situation I get into, and even when I have my hard struggles, and even the times when I'm struggling, my wife even has to call me out at times and and pull me back in when the pressure gets so so hard that I always though remember God how you've been faithful every single time and he's always delivered me because that's the God that I serve folks that invitation is from heaven tonight or tomorrow or whenever you hear this message God is calling you Stop resisting. Stop kicking against the bricks and come home. Jesus is calling. This is Brother Frank on the Remnant Call saying good night and shalom. Trumpet in Zion, sounding on the mountain. Though a trumpet in Zion.